Good afternoon, everyone. We will get started in about four to five minutes. We will allow everyone to join. Can everyone hear and see us okay? If you could just raise your virtual hand. Yeah, wonderful. And good morning to all joining us from South Africa. We know that there's a two hour delay, time delay. So it's 10.30 a.m. there. A warm welcome to all joining us back home in SA. As Farah mentioned, we're just giving some time for our participants to join and we'll get started shortly. I encourage you all to take this time to turn off any notifications on your laptop, your device, and to treat this like an in-person session. For those of you who are just joining, we will get started in a few minutes. So for those of you who have just joined now, a warm welcome to all attending this trauma briefing that we are doing today. My name is Christine Kritzas. I am a counseling psychologist from Lighthouse Arabia. And over the past 13 years, I've been working ex extensively with individuals struggling with anxiety, depression, stress, and burnout. And I'm joined here by my colleague Farah. My name is Farah and I am a clinical social worker and I specialize in working with grief and trauma. I'm joining you today from a mental health clinic in Dubai called The Lighthouse. Thank you, Farah. And for those of you who have just joined, a warm welcome to you all attending. Over the past six days, our country has gone through a civil unrest and there has been violence that has been incomprehensible. There have been lives lost. There have been lives threatened. There are lives that continue to be threatened. I've had messages coming in from friends and family living in South Africa who have shared with me their stories, um, have shared with Farah and I uh, pre this um, trauma briefing, things that have been going on citizens waking up to the sounds of gunshots, going to bed fearing for their lives, citizens running out of food, running out of fuel, queuing in line for hours uh, to stock up on food supplies, citizens that have been having to protect their own neighborhoods due to a lack of protection from our own defense forces. And all of this happening on top of a level four lockdown in South Africa on top of a global pandemic. And if we just think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we know that the basic needs, which are the lowest level needs, our physiological needs of food, water, sleep are being threatened. Our safety needs, feeling safe and secure are being threatened. And so today we, come together to provide a space for all those living in South Africa, those living outside of South Africa, those affected directly and indirectly by the civil unrest taking place. And I'm going to pass over to my colleague Farah now just to share the agenda with all today. Thank you, Christine. And we know that when, as we're looking at the numbers and the prevalence rates of what's happening, and we're saying this is happening in a country where there is 50% unemployment rate, 50% uh, poverty rate, and this trauma is happening on top of so much pre existing injury. And today we're going to be speaking about the invisible injury. We're looking at these numbers of over 70 individuals who have died, um, thousands that have been imprisoned because of many of the criminal activities taking place, and over 200 malls and small and large businesses that have been impacted or destroyed. And we're here today to talk about the invisible injury of trauma that takes place in your mind, your body, and your soul. So I'm not going to pull up my screen um, and we'll be talking about what is common to be feeling inside your mind and body when there's trauma. And what you can imagine is um, 
if you could see your heart and soul right now, you would need to be in the ICU. So while you may be functioning, sitting, listening, thinking, just because you are functioning does not mean that you are actually okay, right? There's a, when, when trauma is acute and fresh, right? We call it, I refer to it as an open wound, right? And many people that I've worked with, they'll speak about it as a fracturing of the self. Sometimes it can feel like your center of gravity has actually shifted. And I will highlight that to witness the trauma and the civil unrest and the violence on the news and particularly on social media is one of the most fracturing and splitting experiences to be scrolling and seeing violence. And then your next post is someone in a swimsuit or their latte and it is very, painful and can actually feel a little bit cruel and unusual. So what we're going to do today is we're going to speak about what's common to be feeling when this wound and this trauma is fresh, what is vicarious or secondary trauma, and who can be impacted because it is not only those who are residing within South Africa, what's normal to be feeling in your thoughts, your feelings, your body, what is the role of grief it as you navigate trauma, what to expect from the coming weeks and months, how to care for yourself, what to do, what not to do. And we will give you some tips on how can you support others in your life right now as well. So just to explain a bit further around the differences between primary trauma and secondary trauma, what we see is that primary trauma refers to people who are currently living in South Africa and who are directly experiencing the violence and who are witnessing the civil unrest as it is unfolding and are responding to these events with intense fear, helplessness, or horror. They are living in or near the conflict. And so that is what we are speaking about when we speak about primary trauma. Secondary trauma, on the other hand, also known as vicarious trauma, is the indirect trauma that individuals can experience after learning the news of the civil unrest which is taking place, after seeing disturbing images or hearing stories about the civil unrest. And it's important to note that individuals not only living in South Africa, but residing in other parts of the globe can also be affected by this. And as Farah mentioned earlier, social media is playing a very big part in, 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 in the secondary trauma that we are experiencing at the moment, because it's as if we are just reliving that continuously. And we are being reminded of it continuously as we go through our social media feed, as we see these images being replayed over and over and over again. And what we also need to note is that children can be experiencing the secondary trauma just by hearing the adults in the environment speak about what is currently taking place. So that is just something that we need to note. And also people with past trauma that can be re-traumatized by what is occurring at present. Thank you, Christine. And I often find that people are minimizing their experience of the trauma and they'll say, well, at least we're all safe or at least no one uh, died or at least our home is okay. Just because there are certain parts of safety that you may have, it doesn't minimize the experience of the trauma. Even seconds or minutes of not knowing whether your home is okay not knowing whether, rel whether a relative is okay, that in itself will induce symptoms of trauma within you, right? So what I want you to know about trauma is that each person's reaction will be as unique as a fingerprint. There's no one roadmap, there's no one way to feel, right? It will all depend on the circumstances your, and your personality. And sometimes I have people say, should I be crying more? Should I be crying less? Should I not be functioning? Should I be, there's no right or wrong way. And I find that 
during this time, there, there tends to be three different clusters of reactions that I want to take a closer look at. And so you, I want you to imagine a home alarm system, right? And that home alarm system gets hyper reactive when trauma takes place. So imagine that even the wind blows and the home alarm starts going off, right? That's what starts happening in our body when trauma takes place, right? There can be hyper arousal, panic, fear, overwhelm, an overwhelming sense of terror, irritability, anger, rage, feeling very on edge. There may be trembling, a lot of anxiety, tearfulness, and you may be experiencing intrusive thoughts, images, someone calls you, the phone rings, and inside your body, it feels like there's so much fear. Like, what news am I going to get now? What am I going to see on the news now? Is everyone okay? Is my home okay? Is the country okay? And there can be that sense of hyper arouse and the threat system is very activated. And it can feel like you're losing control. I need you to know that that does not mean you're crazy or you're responding to this trauma incorrectly. That is a very common response when trauma takes place. It's like that big open wound. Now, other people, while they may react outwardly with what we call hyper arousal, may also implode inward where it feels like they're frozen, paralyzed, not functioning. They may say, I don't feel anything. I feel kind of dead inside. I feel numb or dissociated. You'll say, is this a dream? Is this all real? And I need you to know that this is also a very common trauma response. You may find that over the last week, you've been fluctuating between high anxiety and then other days of feeling quite frozen. I find that it's not that we're always one or the other. You can fluctuate between these, that kind of hyper aroused state of high anxiety and fear and other times feeling quite shut down and paralyzed and frozen. Now, there's another trauma response that can be quite common. And this individual is usually portrayed as the strong one. They're usually the one who gets very focused on where can I donate? Who can I call? What can I do? What can I arrange? And we, we label this person as a strong one, but it's not that they are strong, it's that they are functioning, right? This individual will typically be very action oriented and they will have a delayed reaction. So you may find in yourself or in this person that in the coming weeks and in the coming months, when things settle, whatever that may mean, that you're beginning to see a lot of those signs of exhaustion, mental fatigue, even depressive symptoms may start to set in, okay? And so I want us to be cautious and look out for this person. And remember, there's no right or wrong. Sometimes people judge themselves and they'll say, well, you know, my, my sibling is donating and helping and reaching out and I haven't been able to get out of bed. And there's no right or wrong, right? It's really important. So Christine's gonna walk us through and elaborate on some of the points of what are other feelings that can be very common when trauma is quite fresh. Thank you, Farah. I think important to note on the emotional front is that a lot of people can be experiencing guilt at the moment, guilt around what is happening. What I'm seeing a lot of take place in our expat communities is the survivor's guilt of being outside and looking in and going, I managed to um, get out of the country at a specific time. Um, I am in a different part of the country at, at the moment. It may be people living in South Africa who are living in other parts that haven't been affected as badly as the KwaZulu-Natal areas, as the Gauteng areas, as this area and that area going. I made it out okay, and there are people who I know, who I love, who are struggling at the moment. There can be shame that one is experiencing. I know that um, I've spoken with many friends and family who feel very helpless at the moment about what is taking place, um, feeling hopeless, a sense of disbelief. I've had many people say to me, this is unreal. This doesn't feel real. It feels like I am living in a nightmare at the moment. 
Mm. Some people feeling very betrayed, betrayed by our own people, betrayed by our defense forces, betrayed by our government, um, betrayed by the world. Why aren't people seeing our pain and our suffering? Why aren't people leaning in and helping us the way that we would hope others would? Feeling very overwhelmed. So on the emotional front, we see this and we also see a lot of fear. I had a dear friend reach out to me earlier today and share with me that she has felt fearful about um, contracting the COVID virus. We've been living in fear around the COVID virus and now we're living in fear around a potential war, living in fear for our lives. So that is something that I think we just need to hold and understand on the emotional front. On the cognitive front, you may find that you, you are unable to focus at the moment. We have children who are still engaging in online schooling back home in South Africa, who are maybe struggling to focus at the moment. People who are trying to go to work, people who are trying to continue with their work, people feeling disoriented and forgetful, so these are some things that we may see. And just to highlight, you know, this is what we see predominantly in adults um, as far as adult symptomatology is concerned. As far as children are concerned, I also want parents to note that to be on the lookout for any significant changes in your child's behavior that will alert you to the fact that they're struggling emotionally. This may be clingy behavior, this may be bedwetting, um, difficulty falling asleep at night, waking up feeling very unrested from the previous night's sleep, school refusal, difficulty separating from a primary caregiver, having intrusive thoughts, crying outbursts, flashbacks, avoidance of people or places that remind them of the trauma that they've experienced and are currently experiencing. And then in older children, what you may need to be on the lookout for is aggressive behaviors, lashing out, seeming detached or numb by what is taking place, an inability to focus, crying spells, mood swings. And just to note that these symptoms need to be causing clinical significant impairment in the child's day-to-day -day functioning. And you also want to monitor their symptoms because if these symptoms persist for longer than four weeks, it would be very important to reach out to a mental health care professional and get them the appropriate support, not only for children, but also for adults. And then on the physical front, we know that, you know, since the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of people's fight or flight systems have been activated. That stress response has been activated for over a year now. I had another friend share with me that there's been this lingering anxiety that has been taking place for over a year now. And since the civil unrest that took place six days ago, it has just been heightened and a lot of people's stress responses have been activated. People experiencing heart palpitations, people experiencing heaviness in the chest, nausea, headaches, muscle aches and tension, disrupted sleep, People are unable to fall asleep at night, unable to stay asleep, and experiencing those racing thoughts. On the behavioral front, it may be, as I mentioned earlier, in children, we're seeing the avoidance of people, places that trigger, that link to trauma, as well as in adults. The numbing behaviors, the changes in speech, we may find individuals start stuttering more, or um, are unable to speak, or are speaking very, very quickly. Sensitivity to noises. I've had people share with me that they are woken up by gunshots or um, they are going to bed with gunshots and finding it hard to relate to others. As Farah mentioned earlier, you may go onto social media and you may be exposed to the violence. And the next post you see a friend of yours who is on holiday and it's very difficult to relate to what other people are experiencing at the moment. They can also be people withdrawing and every person will respond differently. 
I think that is very important for us to note. On the spiritual front, we find that when we're experiencing trauma or crisis, that we may start questioning our belief system. We may start questioning, um, asking why is this happening to us right now? Feeling lost, feeling confused, um, and just searching for that meaning and that purpose again. Farah, I don't know if there's anything that you would want to add to the section. I want you to know that some people may lean into faith and find great comfort in it during this time. And during other times, you or someone in your life may lean away and be angry and feel betrayed and ask why. How does this make sense that this is happening to me, us, our community, our home? And I need you to know we don't have the answers to those questions. However, it is important that you allow yourself to feel those things and to meet that questioning with compassion. There's no right or wrong way to feel. And I find that when individuals question or feel angry spiritually, there can be a lot of shame that they experience and say, I don't want to feel this way. But it's important that you allow yourself to explore these feelings with a lot of curiosity and compassion in yourself and in another. Right. So I want to speak about how the role of grief is quite integrated with your trauma right now. And I always say that trauma is really the gateway into this shape-shifting terrain of grief. And when you think about grief and you're thinking, okay, I thought grief was only related to when someone dies. And that's not true. Grief is, we grieve people that we've lost, but grief is also the loss of a dream the loss of safety, the loss of home, the loss of how you hoped people would respond to this situation within communities, within the world, there's a loss. And when you think of grief, I want you to imagine it as having your back to the ocean and never knowing when the waves may arrive or what the size of those waves may actually be. And wrapped in the waves of grief is not only sadness, it's anger, it's frustration, it's um, anxiety, it's fear, it's worry, it's numbness, it's relief, it's confusion. It's a range of every emotion you could possibly imagine. And it's also very physical. It's exhausted, fatigued, struggling to concentrate. It's all of those things. And grief is very different from mourning. Mourning can be cultural or religious. It's wearing white, wearing black, but grief is the internal experience. What does it feel like knowing that this has happened in my home, in my country? Right? I want you to know that we not only grieve people, but these secondary losses I'm mentioning. So loss of feeling safe. You may be saying, I can't believe that this has even happened. You know, we tend to have these invincibility bubbles around us. We know bad things can happen. And I know we know that more than ever in this last year and a half. But nowhere in your template may you have imagined that something of this scale could happen now and at this time with this degree of disruption and unrest, right? There's a loss of home. What, homes feel, what home feels like, the dream of home, events, works, jobs, malls, communities, right? And a sense of belonging. Many people are feeling betrayed and they're grieving and saying, I didn't think communities would respond this way. I didn't think people would respond this way. So there can be a loss of even connection, a loss of being able to relate to others, right? And for many people, there's also a lot, if you have lost a individual as well, there's a loss of your history, right? And I need to, I need to really highlight and emphasize, especially for um, South Africa, is that grief and trauma triggers past grief and trauma. And many people have said, we've experienced similar violence and civil unrest many, many years ago. And that is that wound is being torn open over again, right? And so you may be thinking about past experiences, past trauma, past losses that you've had and thinking, why is this coming up now, right? I need you to know that that's very common 
it doesn't mean that you're actually going crazy. And the very nature of grief, right? So think of trauma as that open wound, right? And we're really, our focus will be on pain management, right? When someone's in the ICU, we're just trying to survive and manage the pain. But this pain is also quite entangled with grief. And so you can imagine the, those grief reactions, those waves are coming in the coming weeks and months and year, right? And so I just want you to have a bit of an understanding of what may be common to be feeling as time is also moving forward. There are some really pervasive myths wrapped around grief and trauma that we want to dispel. Time heals all wounds is a myth. Time does not heal, time passes, it does not heal. With, as time passes, grief and trauma can get softer, but it doesn't finish or resolve it. So when the wound is fresh and open, it's never going to feel exactly like it does right now, this acute, right? But when the wound comes together and heals a bit, it doesn't mean that we forget that it was there or that you will ever be exactly who you were before sustaining this invisible injury, right? Which can be quite daunting. People usually get upset with me. They're like, what do you mean? I want to know that this pain is going to end and it's going to go away and I'm never going to feel this way again. But that grief will stay with you. You know, even in two years or five years, you can look back or hear something or see something and say, I can't believe I lived through that. I can't believe that happened in my home, in my country. I can't believe I've witnessed this, right? So a myth is that grief ends, right? You will survive. However, you will never forget or be exactly who you were prior to this trauma or the losses that are here. Another myth is that you have to move on, right? Like move on, be strong, keep going. And I'm saying we do not move on from trauma. We learn how to move with it, to meet it with compassion, to hold it with compassion. Right? Another, and really as a grief and trauma counselor, I highly despise the word accept. You have to accept this. This is what's happening. And I want you to replace this word acceptance with adjustment. Acceptance, I almost imagine it as you take something, you swallow it, and then you keep going. There's no such thing as acceptance with grief and with trauma. There is only adjustment. I'm adjusting to live with this pain and that this has even happened, but you never accept it and just move on. It's not linear. Right? Another myth is that I just have to ignore it. I just have to numb this and I'll be okay. And I want you to imagine there will be moments, overwhelming moments where you're like, I can't think about this. It's just too much. And in those moments, it's okay for you to distract yourself. However, that is a temporary solution. It's like putting a Band-Aid on, right? You must come back to the pain and what you're feeling and acknowledge it. So imagine it like a teapot, like the emotional pain is like a teapot and the pressure rises and rises. And we have to have some mechanism to let the steam out. If we continue to ignore chronically, then it's like putting debt on a credit card, right? That debt doesn't go away. And by credit card, I mean your body. When we don't feel our feelings, it's stored in our body. And then it, it, it kind of manifests later as depression, anxiety disorders, and even physical health issues, right? So ignoring it or anesthetizing it is a short-term Band-Aid solution, right? Another myth is that you, we need to solve what you're feeling. Everything we're telling you in today's session will not take away the pain. It will not minimize it. It's not going to fix what's here because what you're feeling is actually a healthy emotional reaction to what is happening, right? What we're saying is here's what to expect from this pain as you navigate it. So there's a bit of an understanding. We don't solve grief, right? and it doesn't finish. It's more about learning how to be with it and not do further harm. Another myth is that once this time is over, once the trauma is over, that life will go back to normal or you will go back to normal. And that's just not true. 
you may never be exactly who you were prior to this happening. And that may mean a relationships change. Some people may say, I can't relate to my friends. You know, like they're worried about other things or they're not prioritizing things that are important to me. I'm finding it hard to relate to others. It may be a time where you're even questioning your job and saying, is this meaningful? Do I care about this? Do I want to continue living here? All of these larger existential questions come up where there's no, I'll go back to normal, right? You may never feel exactly how safe you did in your life prior to this, right? The feeling will soften. However, it doesn't completely finish. It's not so black and white, right? So what do you do to heal through this time? So the first thing I want to tell you is, and we've said this a few times, there's no right or wrong. And I know people will say, should I be doing this? Should I not? Should I be doing more? There's no right or wrong way. And when the wound is fresh, our goal is pain management. It's just about surviving this time when the wound is open. So anytime you're feeling very overwhelmed, I want you to approach your day in blocks. Right? You may say, what do I need to do in the next three hours? And if three hours feels too overwhelming, then what do I need to do in the next 30 minutes or one hour to just survive this time? We go back to the basics when trauma is fresh. And conscious breath is an anchor. Sometimes you may say, there's nothing I can do right now, right? But breathe, right? Breathing doesn't solve. It's about soothing. And when we are experiencing trauma, our breathing can actually get quite shallow unintentionally, or we can be hyperventilating. So conscious breath is almost your body's way of saying, you're safe. I am going to take care of you because the home alarm system is hyper aroused, right? So we just walk by the alarm system and everything is being triggered. Uh, like something bad's going to happen. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to survive. And that is you actually letting your body know, I'm going to keep you safe to the best of my ability. And it's going to help you soothe the trauma that's here. It's not like I'm saying just breathe and it'll be okay. No, it's about soothing the system. Another thing that can be really helpful for adults and for children is having routine, right? So that means what time do we wake up? What time do we go to bed? What time do we eat? breakfast, lunch, dinner, and what time do we perhaps take a shower or have bath time? That, that routine can anchor you when the whole world around you feels like it's out of control. Routine can be some way of mitigating some of that anxiety. Okay? Another thing you want to do is hold what we call the tension of the opposites. And what this means is holding two or three competing emotions. For example, you may say, a part of me feels so helpless, right? I feel helpless, I feel overwhelmed, I feel guilty, um, I wish I could do more. And how do you hold that helplessness and also hold other difficult emotions? Like, I feel grateful that uh, some of the many of the people in my life are okay. And I feel thankful that I have certain resources when I know others do not. And I also feel hopeless and despair and overwhelmed. How do I hold this part of me that's saying, I don't think things will ever get better. Even after the situation is controlled, I'm, I feel hopeless and overwhelmed. And another part of me feels hopeful. How do I honor both conflicting parts of me where you can also say, I feel really guilty that I'm okay and others are not. I should be thankful for what I have. Okay, hold gratitude and also hold your despair and your grief. We can hold both of these emotions rather than saying, you know, I should just be grateful. I shouldn't feel my pain. Well, we hold both. You can be grateful and be feeling really broken as many people are, okay? And if there's a pledge I could give you of how to hold and navigate trauma and, grief, and trauma and grief in a healthy way, it's saying, I give myself permission to feel everything I am, any emotion with compassion. 
I will speak to myself as I would someone I love or respect. And I highly doubt you would be saying to other people, just be strong, you need to get through it, don't feel that way, just be positive. It's more about that curiosity, that space, solidarity, not solutions. I'm going to walk alongside you, right? Because nothing can take, nothing can take this away. And that can be really hard for us because there can be that overwhelming traumatic helplessness, right? Now, as you're tending to this wound, right? Trauma means pain management, survival. The first thing we want to do is do no further harm, right? So that means like we don't want to infect the wound. So do not be around people that deplete you, that overwhelm you. And you're like, God, they're, they just suck my energy. You want to completely limit or reduce interaction with them. That can even mean people on social media. Try to keep your environment decluttered if you're able to, because what's happening in our homes or in your space or in your room does impact us as well. You want to limit your relationship with the news. And I know that can be really difficult when you're saying, I need to know what's happening, or, you know, or if I need to take action or some way. Um, and, and that's a fact. However, I need you to be conscious that seeing the images, seeing the videos on your WhatsApp, on your news can further traumatize you. So almost brace yourself consciously before you do check the news and try not to do it first thing in the morning or first thing before bed. That's how we can do more harm. Right? You also want to make sure that you are not being shaming towards yourself. So for example, if you're experiencing the emotion of guilt and you're thinking, you know, I, I wish I was taking more action. You know, I, I saw this video and, or I saw something outside my window, someone was being hurt and I didn't go outside. I felt scared, right? Guilt can be behavior specific. Right? I wish I did something different or I wish I called someone to check on them, right? Guilt can actually be healthy. Shame is lethal. Shame will say, what kind of person are you? Why didn't you call that person or check in on them? Why didn't you take action? And shaming is lethal for our mental health, right? And it completely lacks compassion. So be kind to yourself. Speak to yourself the way you would someone you love. You also really want to eliminate or reduce caffeine because that will exacerbate anxiety right now. And the cortisol and adrenaline in your body is already quite high when trauma is fresh. You also want to avoid substances or alcohol to cope. Alcohol is a depressant, so it can create more risk of depression. Now, people will say things like, oh, take care of yourself. We want to be really specific. What does that actually mean, right? Now, it's common that your sleep may be disrupted right now, where it's hard to concentrate, it's hard to sleep, but to the best of your ability, we want you to try and be protective of your sleep. Ideally, you're getting seven hours. That may be really hard right now, but try to, you know, when I say like, um, you know, imagine you in the ICU and we're saying right now, all you need to do is sleep, water, food, movement, survival, pain management. That is the utmost priority right now, right? Make sure you're eating, even if you're not hungry and trying to move. And if you're saying, I just feel exhausted, then even gentle stretching is okay. Right? Another thing I will say is, it's important that you give yourself permission to feel. And for many of us, we live in quite an emotion phobic world where even prior to trauma, we're saying, I don't know if I really know how to feel my feelings. And how you do that, right, when you feel safe to, is check in for 30 seconds and say, what am I feeling? What do I feel in my body? If what I'm feeling today were a painting, what color would it be? What texture would it be? If it were a weather forecast, what's here? We're just being curious, right? That curiosity is one way how we feel the feeling. Right? We're releasing it, right? Now, you also want to acknowledge the feeling. So I can say, I feel helpless. I feel overwhelmed. I feel scared. Honor that. And we search for soothing, right? 
what may help me navigate and survive this hour as overwhelm and terror and fear is here, right? And that may be connecting with people who are soothing and hopeful or allow you to just feel your feelings. It may be five sensory experiences like lighting a candle or shower or walking. Now, I'm not, we are not saying like, oh, you're upset, you should, you know, light a candle and take a shower. No, no, it's saying, how do we feel the feeling, acknowledge it and search for soothing, not solutions. And that can be really important. This is what we mean by non-negotiable uh, self-care during this time, right? Yeah, Christine, uh, can walk us through ways that you can kind of further reflect on what you and, and your, your kind of inner circle may be experiencing. I think during a time like this, you really need to find your people, connect with your tribe, and either it is that you engage in your personal journaling experience just to reflect on what is happening at the moment, or to meet with your people, to set up Zoom calls with your family. I know that many people are very fearful of leaving their homes at the moment, so this may be an option to consider to set up that Zoom call, to have face-to-face -face communication with family during this time, to check in and ask yourselves and others, what has been the hardest part for me um, about all of this that has been taking place at the moment? What emotions are coming up for me? Something that Farah highlighted earlier and that I think is very important to highlight again is that permission to feel all of our feelings, to give yourself space to feel the difficult emotions, to be able to take time out of your day to sit with those difficult emotions. Because if we do not process those feelings, they just get suppressed, okay? And we need to be asking ourselves and our loved ones, how did your grief show up this week? You know, what are certain experiences that you have lost? Mm. Or it may be that you have physically um, lost something in your life or that, you know, you've lost a loved one during this time. How old do I feel when I'm experiencing these big emotions? Do I feel like that terrified little child? Does it take me back to a past experience? A am I, am I, reading this as the adult or am I reading this as my inner child that is experiencing this at the moment um, and how do I commemorate or how do we commemorate our losses now um, and in six months time and in a year from now and what are some things that we can do to soothe ourselves today or in this week so these are just some things to think about when we're looking at our emotional hygiene, when we're looking at what we can do right now to, um, to you know, be there for, our, for ourselves and for others. As a parent, I would, I would suggest um, maybe even sharing a journal with a child, with a child who struggles to open up, a child who struggles to speak about what's happening, maybe to have a shared journal where um, the parent can write something in the journal and the child can respond. Um, and, you know, when we're looking at emotional hygiene and we're thinking about our children during this time, Farah highlighted something very important earlier about routine. And I would say that routine is the antidote to stress, the antidote to anxiety. And if we're trying to think about how we can be there for our children during this time, I would suggest trying to keep them in that routine as much as possible. I know it's difficult because their times have been, um, the schedule has been changed, children struggling to fall asleep at night, um, you know, children uh, not wanting to go and uh, do their homeschooling out of fear, out of worry, just to tend to those things and to lower your expectations of your child's homeschooling during this time, to lower your expectations of how things should be during this time. You need to remember that we are currently in a global pandemic. And on top of that, we are being fearful of our surroundings, of the civil unrest that is taking place. So just to be the container 
as the parent in, um, in the home because children will turn to the parents and the adults in their environment when they are experiencing um, stress and anxiety. They turn to you to see how you're managing what is happening at the moment. And if, if, uh, if parents are struggling and are um, feeling overwhelmed and anxious about what is happening, that will only spill over onto the child. And that is why it is so important that you have your own space to reflect. You have your own tribe of people that you can go to, that you can share about what is happening, or maybe even um, having access to an online therapist during this time just to process what is going on. So when we're thinking about being there for our children, also important that we share age-appropriate information with them. And, and what I mean by this is that you, you will rather have your child hearing this information from you than them hearing it from their peers, um, you know, over WhatsApp or on social media, that you be the one to be sharing this information with them, that you be the one to be validating their experiences at the moment. And I will go into that in a bit more detail later on about how not to be dismissive and more validating of our children during this time. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. Recognizing the signs that you may, you or someone that you love may need professional support. If you notice as the weeks are moving forward that the intensity of a lot of the signs we've discussed are worsening, your sleep is getting more and more disrupted, the anxiety is worsening, or if you're experiencing panic attacks or suicidal thoughts, we, those are mental health crises, right? That means that you or a loved one may need or, or really should check in with a GP, with a counselor to get extra support. That's really important. If you notice that you're using a lot more of a substance or a certain behavior, to numb or just get through drugs or alcohol, that is another warning sign to get professional support. A GP, counselor, psychologist, psychiatry are all great resources to reach out to. Right? I want you to know that at the Lighthouse, so we are, as I mentioned, a mental health clinic located in Dubai, and we were actually created uh, to sustain something called the Ramey Grief Center. And anytime there's a death, if you have experienced a, a loss in your life, we offer one free grief consultation. And that's a 60 minute session with myself or one of our team members that specializes in grief. And we speak about what it is, what's normal to feel and how to cope with it, uh, cope with grief. That 60 minute session is also a gateway into our free of charge grief support groups that we run throughout the year. So we have grieving during COVID, motherless daughters, an adult grief support group, a pregnancy and infant loss support group, and also surviving after loss to suicide. And you can find out more about that on our website or on our social media. We're now going to speak about what are some things that you can do to support others around you who may be struggling. And I love Maya Angelou's quote, which is, people will forget what you say, but they will not forget how you make them feel, right? So a lot of how to support people who are living with trauma is more about solidarity than what to say, what not to say. And, and, I, and I'll just emphasize this again, we're not searching for a fix or a solution. It's more about walking alongside. And when you're thinking of reaching out to others, you must make sure you're okay first. If you're feeling depleted, not okay, not sleeping, anxious, it's important that you do not care for others during that time and you go inward and get protective of what we've mentioned today. So always start with you first, right? You do not want to force others to share the details of what they're seeing or hearing. So don't say, tell me what happened, what's happening there, what did you see? You may be curious, but when they share the details, it can actually re-traumatize the individual. You may opt to say, you know, I'm curious about what's going on. I'm here to listen if you'd like to talk. If they start crying, do not discourage them. I always say, I actually invite your tears. I invite your grief and it's welcome here. 
people usually apologize for what they're feeling or when they cry and say, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. Say, no, it's welcome here. Right? And when trauma is fresh, people in your life may be reactive, irritable, shutting down, not responding, angry, really common. So we don't want to take those reactions personally. And we do not want to give advice unless it's asked for, right? And even then I would say, well, here's what I think, or here's what would work for me. But you don't wanna say, you just need to you know, work out or you just need to be positive. That's how we actually end up doing more harm than supporting someone. And on that note, I think, you know, often we will try to be supportive to those around us, but without realizing it, we can actually be quite dismissive of somebody else's experience. You know, we often hear people saying things like, at least um, your community hasn't been affected yet, or at least you live abroad, or at least you know, you still have a job. And that can be quite dismissive of what your experience may be during a time like this. So to avoid saying things like, um, stop being so negative, you being dramatic or you being sensitive or, or things like be strong or be positive. There's also this toxic positivity that people sometimes try and force onto those around them. And it's important that we can hold the pain alongside the gratitude. Like Farah mentioned earlier, holding the tension of the opposites is very important here. We can, I've heard people say to me that I am, you know, I am just overwhelmed by all the support that we've received in our community during this time. It's been very heartwarming to see how the community has come together and how we are trying to protect our own people and we're trying to offer help and support. But alongside that is also the fear that continues to linger. Um, and saying things like, at least, at least you have this, at least you have that, can be very, very dismissive of a person's experience. And saying things like, please don't cry. And adults saying to children, things like, don't worry, my darling, don't worry, my angel, um, mommy or daddy are yet to protect you during this time can be quite dismissive of the child's experience or saying to the child things like, you've got so much to be grateful for. Um, you have a, a roof over your head at the moment. Um, it hasn't affected our community yet. I don't know what you're carrying on about. And these things can be very dismissive. And for parents, I would suggest taking time out and being more curious about your child's experience during this time instead of saying, don't worry, to look at your child and say, I can see you feeling quite worried at the moment. What might be making you feel worried? Because the child may have a completely different narrative to what's going on in the parent's mind about what is taking place at present. Absolutely. And I'll add, make sure you're not saying any of these things to yourself because that can also do harm to you. And many of the South African expats here they'll say, well, why should I, why should I feel overwhelmed and traumatized when I have access to food and have a home and I'm safe? I'm safe in this community. And that is incredibly dismissive because we know that even though you may not be living there, you can be as equally traumatized with that secondary trauma. And that's where you can hold, I'm grateful for what I have, the resources, having a job. And I also acknowledge the pain and the grief and the despair that I'm feeling we hold both. Yeah. So the things you do want to do, you want to offer solidarity through listening, listening by asking open-ended questions and being empathic. If you can help with anything practical, it's really important when trauma is fresh because when it's fresh, it, you know, this frontal lobe is offline and so if you can help with groceries or practical things or helping with childcare, um, any paperwork or admin, it can be really helpful. Keep up caring contact. Don't expect people to respond, but you may say, I'm thinking of you, um, you know, you're on my mind. If you'd like to talk, I'm here. And if there has been a death, be sure to say that person's name, you know, 
usually people stop saying the individual's name or saying the traumatic incident. They think, I don't want to remind you of what you're going through. You're not reminding them that they're traumatized or experiencing grief. You're just reminding them you remembered and you cared, right? So don't, don't shy away from saying the loved one's name. And here are some things you can say. So I would suggest standing in a position of curiosity and, you know, uh, being very curious about somebody's experience, being very curious about your own experience, as opposed to standing in a position of judgment and knowing. When we are curious with those around us, we allow for the conversation to go a lot deeper. We allow for those meaningful conversations to unfold, to be able to look at someone and say, how have you been doing during this time? Um, would you feel comfortable to share more with me about what has been going on for you during a time like this? Or to try and clarify what somebody means when they say X, Y, and Z. How can I help you during this time? What can we do to help you during this time? Um, and to, to be able to you know, give somebody space the greatest act of generosity these days is giving someone of your time to be able to say, I'm here to listen if you'd like to talk. Or even just saying, I don't even know what to say, but I'm so glad that you told me. Yeah. I've often had people say, but what can I say to this person who's experienced this loss? And often it is just sitting with someone in their pain. It's not always what we say. It's just being there for someone during a time like this offering your uh, support, um, being able to say to them, do not apologize for your crying. That will allow them space to feel all of their feelings and being able to reflect on their experience with children as well to be able to name it, to tame it. Dan Siegel, who's a clinical professor from UCLA often speaks about naming it, to tame it and how adults can turn to children in the, the environment and name the emotion that they're experiencing. And that can help soothe their system down to say, I can see you feeling worried, scared, terrified at what is happening at, mo at the moment. Mm. Thank you, Christine. And we are going to be finishing off today's session with a quote from our late father of the nation, Nelson Mandela. I'm fundamentally an optimist. Whether that comes from nature or nurture, I cannot say. Part of being an optimist is keeping one's head pointed towards the sun, one's feet moving forward. There were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was sorely tested, but I would not and could not give myself up to despair. That way lays to defeat and death. And just to mention again that I think there have been a lot of people in the community who've been overwhelmed by the love and support and the care that has been extended to um, others during a time like this. But at the same time, sitting with a lot of grief and loss and despair. And just to use your resources in this time in the sense that you reach out to your tribe, that you reach out to your people, that you don't go at this alone. Thank you, Christine. So before we ask you to submit any questions, comments, or reflections, you can put them anonymously in the chat. We also want to highlight our different social media accounts where you can ask questions. And there's a lot of resources on supporting children, supporting trauma, and building emotional intelligence within yourself and your community. So you can just take a look at those and we'll stop sharing. And if you have any questions, you can submit them in the little Q&A box and, and we have about uh, five to 10 minutes we can stay with you. I will say that today's session is being recorded. So I believe it will be put up on YouTube in the next few days so you can share it or rewatch it. Farah, I see some questions coming through in the Q&A section. 
One in particular that says, I'm South African, but I'm based in the UAE. I came to Durban to work remotely. I'm feeling so frazzled. Everything happened so suddenly and it's heartbreaking to see childhood places I love being destroyed. Is it normal in this situation to feel nervous, confused and preoccupied, even if I am in a relatively safe area? So just going back to what we spoke about earlier, that even though you are not being directly affected by what is currently taking place, you yourself can be experiencing secondary as a result of what is happening at the moment. And even just seeing the childhood you know, places being destroyed, knowing that you were once there in that community, that you were once one of those children can be yeah. very, very debilitating for someone. Yeah. And that's where the grief lives alongside that. It's the loss of those memories. It's the loss of your history. It's the loss of, of home in many ways. So that is a very valid trauma response and a grief response as well. Thank you, Farah. I see more questions coming through here. Yeah? Unfortunately, there are a lot of videos and screenshots circulating online where people express their anger by being racist. This is very triggering and traumatic for South Africans. How do we deal with the racism aspect of it? I think um, what I hear you asking is that as you are observing and witnessing the trauma and the videos, alongside that, you are also witnessing racism, right? And I would say that is another layer of a traumatic injury that is living alongside this, that is so intertwined with the experience of being South African and living in South Africa. And I would say, you must also be curious about processing that trauma. What does it feel like to witness this racism alongside the violence we're seeing? Where does that come up in my body? How do I create space to ventilate that? It's not about solving it. It's processing the feeling and not going at it alone because that is, that is an embedded part of the trauma that's here as well. And I think Farah, just to add on to that, the systemic issue of racism that is being highlighted at the moment during a time like this, everything is under the microscope at the moment. Everything is exaggerated at the moment, which can be very triggering in itself. Yeah, yeah. So we have a question. I have, uh, the individual has said, I've been diagnosed with PTSD. Should I tell my colleagues or can I keep it private? I'm reluctant to be prejudiced um, uh, now or in the future. Some days I feel like I can't function. I do think it's important that you disclose this to the appropriate individual. You know, the same way if you said to me, I'm really struggling because of a physical illness or because of a physical disease I have, ideally we would want to let your employer or your manager or leadership know um, so that you can have an appropriate accommodation and flexibility. If you're not functioning, ideally you can take some medical leave I know that some workplaces can retaliate against mental illnesses, or there may be a fear of being judged or let go. You may then meet with a GP or a physical health doctor, let them know what's going on and get a sick leave note so that you can take care of yourself as you're navigating this, right? But ideally, you're, ideally you're in a workplace where it's safe to tell people or tell the right people at least. Farah, I've seen another question come through. I've had five of my closest friends lose someone close to them, a father, an uncle, and I've been the person that most people turn to because I'm a very objective person, but I feel myself getting overwhelmed and anxious about everything. How do I deal with these feelings while still being there for them? And I can think that that can be really challenging at the moment where you find that th th there's often a person that's labeled as the pillar the pillar of the family, the go-to person, the person we can rely on. 
but it's so important that you do take some time out just to reflect on what it is that you're experiencing at the moment, that you have a person in your community, in your inner circle that you yourself can be vulnerable with, I think will be very important during this time. Because just as you are caring so much for these people, with time, you are also borrowing from the future where you are going to need to be carried. And so just having that space um, or that person that you can speak to, and if it is that you don't have anyone in your inner circle that you can speak to, perhaps to, to engage in a journaling exercise where you can just reflect on what feelings are coming up for you right now. Another thing that I would um, add is meet yourself where you're at. So it may, uh, given your energy levels, it may not be that you physically see all five of those friends or give them a call or do a Zoom call. Maybe with the energy level that you're at, it's a, it's a message. And, and maybe it's not even an open-ended question, like, how are you? Maybe it's, I'm really thinking of you, right? That may still be a kind, compassionate touch point, but it aligns with the amount of energy you have on that day or that week. Thank you, Farah. I see an, another question that's come through. I'm also aware of time, um, but I think we can take these questions. I'm feeling really lethargic and frazzled being here in South Africa. My family overseas are urging me to come back to the UAE, but I just feel like sleeping all day. I can't even get together to arrange my travel back. Is it okay to just disconnect? I think, you know, just going back to what Farah said earlier about there's no right or wrong way to be dealing with what is taking place at the moment. If for you right now, it helps to disconnect from the family, then that's what you need to do. If it means that, you know, the, the, the constant messages, you know, saying things like you need to come back to the UAE are putting more and more pressure on you, it may be helpful to disconnect from them, but do not disconnect completely from your support network. Do you have someone in your support network that you can be speaking to at present? Yeah, so we have, these, we have two more questions we're going to take and then we're going to wrap up. One says, how do I deal with my problem to accept, and you guys know I don't like that word accept, so I'm going to come back to that. How do I accept incompetence of people in authoritarian positions? Uh, that are as now in, in South Africa. There's no such thing as acceptance with the nature of the trauma and the complexity of what you're experiencing. It's how do I adjust to this injustice? And some days and weeks will be better than others. You may have one week where you say, all right, I feel a little bit adjusted. I feel like I'm functioning. I don't feel so angry or betrayed or frustrated. And other, other days it may be, really hijacking, right? It's more about allowing yourself to feel it, processing it, being curious, not going at it alone, and making sure you're taking care of yourself, right? We have another question. Hi, I'm South African. I'm in Cape Town, and my family is in Durban, in areas that are have been attacked, and I feel a little helpless being far away and not being able to help. My anxiety has heightened, what do you recommend I can do to remain calm and help from so far away? Um, so one thing I would say is this is a great example of holding those tension of the opposites where you say, how do I hold my helplessness? And what are the things that I can do to that may be helpful? And I would suggest even checking in with them and saying, what can I do that would be helpful for you this week? Right? And it may be a message it may be a Zoom call, it may be something super practical, but I would ask them and also see where am I at? Where are my energy levels? What am I able to do this week? Right. Would you add anything, Christine, to that? I think just going back to the routine, the rituals, and you know, just having some space where you can be, be trying to look after your physical body during a time like this. And as, a, as difficult as it, as it may be to focus on your sleep, to focus on your nutrition, and to focus on um, 
a, a bit of that exercise if possible if you know if it allows for you to get out a bit I know that you know there have been people sharing with me that they want to take their dogs for a walk and they are fearful of going outside into the community so we we, we you know we urge you to do what what you can do during a time like this and to try and keep a routine as much as possible if possible and if it is that you are finding that the anxiety is spiraling out of control. Um, it may be helpful to, to, to look at uh, getting some online support, um, you know, in the form of therapy, or it may be just reaching out to a loved one and, and, and having that one-on-one -on -one time to connect and share about your experience. So thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to be here, to be with us, to commemorate together as a community. To join. Grief and trauma is not meant to, to be navigated alone. We've had more than 180 individuals come together during today's webinar who are really hurting. Please take care of yourself. Give yourself some transition time. Get up, get out of the space that you're in practice some deep breathing. This session will be put on YouTube in the next few days where you can reference it again if you need to. Right. Any fi final words from you, Christine? Just to, just to take care of yourselves and those around you and sending much love back home. Yeah, take care everyone. Bye, bye Christine.